So I'd like to welcome everybody. And my name is Robert Winters. I'm president of McGill Community for Lifelong Learning. I'd like to welcome you to this groundbreaking lecture series that marks a new collaboration between MCLL and the McGill University Retiree Association, or MIRA. To help us launch these lectures, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Carola Vial, Dean of the School of Continuing Studies. A political scientist and policy analyst by training with a focus on international relations, human security and migration, and public diplomacy. Carola previously served as founding dean of the School of Professional and Extended Studies at American University in Washington. In that capacity, she oversaw the delivery of lifelong experiential learning programs at all levels, from pre-collegiate to post-retirement. We are very happy to have you here with us today, Carola. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you. Uh, bienvenue, bonjour. I'm delighted to be here today, uh, although I should say we have no heat in our building. I was overhearing a conversation earlier, uh, so I'm hoping that uh, Montreal warms up a little bit. <laughs> so um, I uh, want to just give you a few uh, welcoming remarks, and I'm very much looking forward to this series. I should note that I come to you today from Montreal or Jojage, which is unceded territory of the Kanyakehaga people. Uh, McGill itself sits on land uh, that has traditionally served as a gathering place for the Haudenosaunee and, and the Anishinaabe nations. And uh, so I'm always delighted to be part of these conversations because we are continuing this tradition that has a long, long history in this space, uh, both virtually and physically. I am very pleased to welcome you today uh, on this uh, for this important series on mental health, co-sponsored by the McGill Community for Lifelong Learning, which is part of the School of Continuing Studies and the McGill University Retiree Association. Mental health issues and their consequences seem particularly challenging because they should be preventable or curable, yet also seem so insurmountable, ever present. And while much work has been done to destigmatize mental health issues, we struggle as a society and as individuals with how to accept and manage the many different forms and the losses that can result from mental health disorders. But as the philosopher Henry David Thoreau once noted, not until we are lost do we begin to understand ourselves. This series is important to me on a personal level as well. I've lost several members of my extended family to suicide, and several members have battled with depression on and off for much of their lives. I have a parent who has struggled with bipolar disorder and now dementia for much of their life. Poor mental health impacts not only those who are suffering it directly, but their family, friends, and colleagues, who all too often feel helpless and frustrated. And yet I'm reminded of the hospice pioneer, psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross admonition that the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their ways out of the depth. Beautiful people do not just happen. So I'm glad to be here among many beautiful people. The COVID-19 pandemic only exasperated an already existing growth in mental health disorders, making whole of human health ever more critical. So I very much thank Mura and MCLL for this timely series, which such phenomenal expertise over the next five sessions that will help us understand and value better the place that mental health and mental health disorders play in human life. Be well. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Carola. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Antti Pagin, president of MIRA, who has been critical 
in helping build MCLL's relationship with this important group representing retired McGill employees. At McGill since 1976, professor in pharmacology and therapeutics, Antti has done research in neuroscience, pharmacology, therapeutics, and also clinical research on alcoholism. Antti also has 30 years of experience using information technology to manage patient care in intensive care units and in medical education. He's the founder and director of E. Medici de McGill, an orchestra that plays classical music with a professional conductor. The next concert is a benefit for people suffering from the war in Ukraine on May 19. Antti has organized this series of presentations on behalf of our two organizations. Thank you, Antti. Today's session is the first, and the other four are not to be missed. Go ahead, please, Antti. Thank you, Robert, for this introduction. Uh, also, thank you, Dean Weil. You have mentioned just about everything that needs to be mentioned before we start actually listening to the speaker. Uh, so I have very little to say in addition, except to mention that uh, the situation in which we live, and there is more than one. One is COVID pandemic. We still don't have all the data, but increasing number of data, and I'm sure that uh, Mark, Dr. Laporta is going to mention some of this, that ep uh, epidemics really uncover mental health problems. And that is going back to the Spanish flu when this was noticed. Um, so uh, the, this is one of the factors that kind of uh, uh, um, focused on the issue of mental health as a topic for this type of uh, lectures. The other is that we live in a increasingly conflicting world and that uh, we may not be directly involved but reading the newspapers of different things happening around the world is one of the things that uh, brings us to the issue uh, how does the environment influence his mental health this is one of these in fact never finished stories uh, sometimes it's said it is environment or, uh, shall we say, inborn things. It's not or, it is always together. And down the line in one of these lectures, this will be a little bit more clear. So I, I think I should stop this um, introductory word, uh, reminding us of what Dean Weil said, and uh, introduce our speaker. Mark Laporta is a psychiatrist at MUHC. We already heard that he also is the founder of a collaborative unit of World Health Organization for Mental Diseases. And he's also running something that's very important in uh, psychiatry, and that is early detect detection um, of the mental health problems. He's not only a psychiatrist, but he's also a musician. And that's how we met many years ago. Uh, we even or once organized a symposium on mental health. No, it was not called mental health. It was called psychiatry and music. And that's a topic that I think there is some interest in this group to do it maybe next year. In any case, uh, it's not the only thing. I think very important for our uh, full assessment is that um, of the speaker is that Mark Laporte is also a proud father of two daughters. So with these few words, I would pass the, uh, I would like to ask Mark to start his lecture. The first thing would be probably to share the screen and show us the slides. <clears throat> Great, okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. And really, I, you've, you've said maybe the most important part of what needed to be, be said um, from the heart, and um, what uh, Dean Weil revealed is the kind of thing that made it possible for mental health issues to become um, taken seriously, you know, that people are able to open up and, and, and state that, yes, they are touched. Um, we are all touched directly or indirectly, 
And it's something which was quite invisible, you know, stigma was mentioned. Um, the fact that um, sometimes the, uh, the signs of mental illness are really not that visible. And so it's a, really, it's a, it's, it's a complex and fascinating issue that is what we call cross-cutting. It touches, touches on everything. So it, would, it makes it a little difficult to choose where to start uh, for a lecture like this. And really, I'm, I'm really humbled by uh, your invitation. And, 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 you know, I was trying to figure out how to, um, how to focus it. So it's going to be, you know, give me feedback and we can focus it better next time if you think that it's a little academic. But I, I did want to go through um, a few aspects of uh, what it means, uh, the impact of mental health and mental illness, and uh, how we know about the impact of, of them, and uh, what we maybe what we're starting to do something about. So I, I decided to do it in a form of a lecture, but really, please, uh, I don't think that it should be, uh, you know, a, a monologue and then a question period. We can, we can have questions as we go. Um, and I think we have about 40, 45 minutes. So we'll see how we can fit that in. But this is some idea what we're gonna, uh, what we're gonna cover. You know, some of the concepts that are associated with, the, you know, everybody talks about global mental health because um, it's an issue which, which, as we just said, touches everyone. So how do we know about the global picture? Uh, some of the main challenges, some solutions that are proposed, and um, how it's cross-cutting uh, with uh, many other issues like, like human rights, social determinants, as you know, um, people with mental health disorders that where, where it is not recognized uh, often end up in jails, end up you know, on the street, as we mentioned. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, this is just our little agenda to keep me in line. So I, I thought I'd start with a quick quiz and um, maybe you want to answer either in writing in your minds or you can you can write them in the chat so how many people what proportion of the population do you think will have a mental health problem in their lifetime anyone uh want to peep up with a guess three no 45 percent Okay, this is a you know this is a, um, a a new problem that I had also in medical school when I was teaching the medical students, and you know the numbers are actually <laughs> you know we were impressing people with the numbers initially. Now people think that it's actually higher because we're so sensitized. But the number on paper is twenty to twenty five percent, which means one in one in four to one in five. You know it's a very very high proportion when you think of it. Whoops. You got the answer there. How many children experience distress from a mental health problem each year? Again, 20%, as you just saw. So that's very major because, as you know, this is a um, domino effect where the children who have difficulties then are likely to develop difficulties at other levels, like socially or academically, et cetera. So very, very important factor. Um, Number of teenagers experiencing distress. I'm sure that many of you are going to say more than 65% if you have or have had teenagers at home. But in terms of um, of uh, what's what, what we know from the data that we get from the various countries, it's about 20% or more as well. Um, now, the, the percentage of people who require care and who do not receive it Okay, this is going to vary, obviously, from country to country, but what, what's your guess there? So it's, a, you know, a good 50%. So in, you know, it, it varies, that's even in Canada. So it varies quite a bit from place to place. There are many countries, as you can imagine, where it's much higher than that, but troubling. Um, what is the difference in life expectancy for people with mental health problems? Do they, um, do they live longer? Do they live less long? What do you think? 20 years less. Okay, this is really 
Amazing. And we'll talk a little bit about that with the overlap with also medical problems. And <clears throat> because, you know, mental illness itself um, isn't uh, a system that's, uh, you know, uh, that, that's, that's gone wrong. It's, 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 you know, mainly behavioral. So it's quite something. The number by the WHO um, of suicide, uh, suicides per year, it's close to a million is the number that we have, okay? So really, really very major again, and a lot of this would be preventable. So I just thought I'd start with that and I'll ask you those questions again at the end. <laughs> so you'll feel like you've consolidated that data. Uh, just, so, to, just to say it, it's of the exams at the end. Yeah, oh, okay. Not to scare the public. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you, you will not be marked on it. <clears throat> Although that would be a good way of seeing how uh, ubiquitous anxiety is for all of us. Um, okay, do you want to give me a thought of what you feel um, the effects of mental health conditions are on functioning? May, or maybe you just want to think about it or jot some things in to the chat. You want to do that? I don't know if I'm going to have access to the... Not sure that I'm going to have access to that. Okay, are you are we going to go with your putting that in your minds? Thinking, think of which effects you think there are at which level. Anybody care to volunteer some um, some effects they may be thinking of? Loss of jobs. Okay. So, and if we push that further, poverty can be part of it. Poverty, yeah. It can it can, it can affect uh, your ability to uh, to health because you you may not even be able to feed yourself adequately. Yeah. There there are physical effects from mental health problems, physical effects on the body. So the the, the mind body connection, and uh, it's affected in many different ways. Okay. Do you have specific examples or? We uh, well, you know, anxiety, um, it, it, it builds up the, um, is it cortisol in the bloodstream? And that can have other things, other effects in your body in the long term and, and so okay. on. Um, uh, if you're, uh, yeah. uh, depression can lead to um, uh, cognitive problems. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, so, right. you know, there's, uh, there's all sorts of connections between mental health and, and the effects on the body. Great. Thanks. Anyone else? I so, think, you know, um, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that, um, you know, just thinking about trying to get out of bed in the morning is an exhausting experience. It's, um, uh, you just don't want to do anything. All you want to do is just stay in bed. And so you're, you're going to ignore things that are very important in terms of taking care of the family, yeah. um, including taking care of yourself. So uh, I, I think that, that that is a major effect. We often underestimate the interpersonal aspects of it. It's true because all these, um, these kinds of disorders affect uh, your behavior, which affects also the... Uh, response that there is to other people around you. And you can think, for example, of uh, people who have young children or teenagers who really need a lot of input, may just not have the wherewithal to be thinking of how to help them resolve problems, how to help them navigate the world that they're discovering. So yeah, lots of interpersonal issues as well. So there, there, there are risks at an individual level. So again, we're emphasizing the cross-cutting nature of it. And then there are risks for caregivers as well that we can we can look at. So people who are involved with someone with a mental illness often will um, have complications themselves uh, and may develop, you know, a sense of burden themselves. And there can be secondary uh, mental health disorders as well. And then the what interests the people that we work with uh, for a collaborating center for the WHO is what it means for that society, right? So for uh, productivity and uh, the costs and that's where they say okay let's do something about this let's see if we can do some prevention 
So there's, um, <clears throat> there's an effect also which is economic and, um, and political. So including, you know, the, the worry that people have of violence, sometimes which is exaggerated, but uh, really the costs are, are enormous. Just in job loss, uh, absenteeism uh, already, you know, like what you were mentioning about getting up in the morning, very, very major. Okay, so that's that's very, very overall global picture. And I don't want it to be only grim, okay? So it sounds like I'm, we're going in a very grim direction, but remember through this that most mental illnesses are episodic <clears throat> and people get better. So we'll talk about that later too. So. Um, but nevertheless, overall, if you look at the population uh, of a country or globally, uh, the effects are, 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 are major. So, you know, this is what justifies uh, from the perspective of the UN and WHO to really look at this seriously. Okay, so I wanted to just do a quick overview of where, where we're coming from. So just a, a global idea of what is a mental illness. Right? Many of you have talked about uh, depression. You've talked about some um, some of the symptoms that might go, uh, you know, anxiety. So you've heard about uh, these diagnoses. So really, they affect very often. Someone mentioned your thinking, um, obviously your mood uh, and your daily functioning, and as well we talked about relationships, right? So uh, they're episodic. Uh, so this is something which is interesting because it makes them identifiable. This is not just a way of being, uh, but it's something which comes usually episodically, although it's not always the case, but uh, we're talking about something here that <clears throat> we're categorizing in the general world of medical disorders that you know have a syndromal kind of picture. Um, so all of these are true. Um, now, the more tough question is, what is mental health? Uh, I'd really like to hear from you who, um, you know, have obviously thought about this and are, are, are looking to, you're maintaining your own mental health by participating in this kind of course. What's your view of mental health? Mm. I'll give you... A very simple set of possibilities. Okay. Okay. Oh, there are two Sherry? questions. Yeah, Sherry, you have. Uh... Well, I was I was just going to say functioning well yeah. in life. Yeah. Um, yeah. With work, family, relationships, uh, interests, etc. Um, right. That to me is what mental health. Yeah. Is. Okay. Good. Yanina. Uh, yeah, I was going to pretty much say the same as the previous uh, speaker, but um, also in a healthy manner, being able to function in society uh, in a healthy way, not dangerous. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, you, you can be daring. You can be, um, you, you know, you, you, you can have your own ideas, but yeah, let's not be dangerous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. <laughs> So you're, 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 you're very right. So I've given you this as, a, as a, another little quiz-like thing. But I think the idea is it's not just the absence of a psychiatric condition. So treating a psychiatric condition is not mental health. It's removing a mental illness, it's true. But uh, we're going to be a little more demanding than that. Um, so having the capacity to enjoy life more in a more general way and to deal with challenges as they come about. And I think to uh, take your place, really, a lot of it is about taking your place in the world. Um, so you answered that. So, you know, we wondered at one point, you know, when did mental health become something that was really considered? Um, we didn't hear about it that much because we heard a lot about infectious diseases, which were primordial, you know, which were really a primary concern for a long time. Uh, including since the uh, creation of the UN. But really, in the WHO's constitution very early on, already we we're talking about mental and social well being, which is, you know, very, you know, a lot of foresight there in 1948, which we seem to have forgotten for a while after that. But um, so we talked about a complete physical, mental, and social well being 
uh, as being a definition of of mental of of uh, of health, and mental health was part of it. So the highest attainable standard of health was defined as a, a fundamental human right. So you know, this is really quite a high order. Um, you know, so and the idea is that if anyone gets health in any part of the world, that will have benefits way beyond uh, where, 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 where health is, is, uh, is attained. So you, you, you will have benefits beyond just the person that you're, that you're treating or the country that you're treating. So when the WHO came up with this um, and the UN, that was, as you can see, it's, not, it's a nice definition. It looks like you know, positive health. But it's also uh, daring. It's quite daring to say this to many countries where you're saying, okay, look, this is what we expect. Um, are you willing to put that behind? Do you feel that people should have um, a state of uh, mental and social well-being? And what do you mean by that? So, you know, if you just read any newspaper this morning, you're going to see that we seem to have a lot of very, 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 very variable definitions of what that may mean from one part of the world to the other. So when we talk about, so we've talked about mental illness, we've talked about mental health uh, briefly. And now when we talk about something global, what's your idea of what makes the global aspect of mental health? What are the, uh, maybe I'll just go into it. So when we talk about global, we're really talking about patterns um, that affect populations globally inclusively. So this is something which we share in across the world. And so it means that we need an approach which transcends borders. Again, we talked about things like stigma, for example, that really affect access to care. <clears throat> stigma is something which goes way beyond borders um, and um, requires an intervention that goes beyond borders as well. And we will gain by looking at it from something from, from a perspective which is a global one coming, for example, from the UN. Um, and this, the kinds of solutions, just like when we talk now about global warming, we're saying, oh, look, the solutions are really, you know, each one of us has, has to pull our weight, but we really need um, a concerted approach to this. So this is what we mean by global mental health. Uh, the issues, uh, the patterns are, are global. The, uh, um, the, uh, the issues require an approach which goes beyond and they're often political. Okay, does that make sense to you? Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Perhaps we could bring this idea that varies from country to country. Maybe it varies from one country to the rest of the world. And that is that health is not a commodity. Health is a public good which really determines what we are going to do with it. Right. That's, do you want to push that further, Ante? No, I think you, you know what to do. <laughs> okay. I mean, this is, uh, this is a problem that uh, uh, really uh, is uh, making uh, solutions in some environments almost impossible because if you are selling it, as uh, vegetables, the behavior is completely different. If you think that this is a public good, and why is it public good? Because if my neighbor gets sick, I may get sick. So there is also even an individualistic uh, um, view of this. But uh, that's, that's why uh, that's why infectious diseases were always the, uh, I would say, the easiest easiest example to use when you talked about global health. Right. And we saw that with the, uh, the, the, the two, two and a half years of COVID. Yeah. And uh, for example, the change of approach that China took to uh, overprotecting people to the point where there was, uh, there was a sense that, uh, that, um, that people were, were being confined um, overly severely to unconfining completely. And then you're having, you can't even keep uh, keep track of the numbers of people who are probably you know, certainly suffering and, and many dying. So it's a, it's an issue which is easier to put in words uh, than to define. And uh, the health, once again, with what you're saying, Ante, is not only physical health, but 
social health and psychological health, and that's where the balance becomes very complex. I, I don't think we have an answer to it, but we, I think the answer that we uh, probably will agree on is that you, have to, you never can sit on a, a simple, single definition, but that you're having to think of the global issues all the time and balance them constantly by bringing in as much information and knowledge as possible to understand which, which ways are going to be most effect, effective and efficient. But I'm not going to offer a single solution to this. And that is very visible when we talk about uh, therapeutic interventions that obviously cannot be single pill, right? Right. Yeah, the more we go, the more we, you know, we're going to talk about, you. as you know, the whole issue of social determinants of health, how intimately linked um, our health is uh, with, with determinants that don't look like they're part of health. It speaks to the political difficulty of intervening because you're, you're, you need to involve more than a ministry of health when you're talking about health. Uh, there are many ministries involved and there's a lot of interactions that need to be taken into account and we're not yet, I think we haven't quite arrived at a point where we know how to um, coordinate uh, these kinds of responses uh, ideally. And then that coordination will be different for different populations, even within a country. For example, uh, there are groups that are often more isolated than others. Uh, typically in Canada, you have indigenous groups that are much more isolated than others and may not have the resources such as uh, water or access to care uh, that are that are equal. So there's there's really an inequity there that renders um, puts you in a situation where you have to really assess each specific situation and be both global and very local. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the um, the issues of how. Um, we're able to recognize these issues. I don't know if you're seeing, if I, if I make my screen a little smaller, oh, you're seeing the same thing as I am now, right? You mind if I make the slides a little smaller, like this? I think that'll be just as good, right? That's okay, good. so because I couldn't see my the top of my slide. Hmm. So, so we know that uh, mental health problems are global. We know that they're, uh, they have an impact. And I want to tell you a little bit more about how we know that they're global. Okay, so this is where I think the WHO did a great job in uh, really trying to identify through the input of data from the various um, countries that are part of the UN um, on data. And that was not necessarily easy to get to. So, you know, overall, when we look at the share of the population with mental health disorders, you, you can draw a map of this. And um, it's a map which is uh, impressive and gives you a clear sense right off the bat that you have something which is global here. Um, this, by the way, uh, if you have access to this link, is a really interesting place to go because you can, you can pull this ledger here between 1990 and 2019, and look how things change. It's really change, really a, pretty entertaining to look at that. I, I'm, I'm worried that I'm going to run out of time if I do it, but I strongly recommend that you go to the site. So, um, how do we calculate this? We calculate it by looking at overall what is the burden of disease. Like, if we look at diseases as a whole. Uh, we consider that the burden of diseases as a whole will be 100%. And then we try to break it down into the contribution of each disease category and look at what the contributions are of each one. So this is what I want to talk about a little bit now. So disease burden um, is uh, one which was a little bit, like I say, a little more difficult to understand when we started looking beyond mortality. So um, the issue of dealing with chronic illness as we're better at dealing with infectious diseases was not an easy thing to, to, to come around to. So how do we calculate the impact of mental health problems? What do you think? Obviously, I just hinted at it. 
but you can understand that we are we're looking at premature mortality so mortality before the expected uh, age that people would would, would deceive but also we're looking at uh, years of suboptimal health so that's a lot more contentious okay so years of life lost to disability so you know it's both of those and being able to think of both of those is what revolutionized our ability to understand a disease burden okay so a little graphic would show you that you know you can say that good health uh, is something which is um, uh, which is um, halted which is shortened by partial health and then by premature death right so you have uh, years of with disability years lived with disability and then you have um, years of life lost and so when we talk about disability adjusted life years um, we're talking about all of that okay so that was what brought mental health to the forefront so in this first study of gbd uh, we came up with non-fatal outcomes um, and these non-fatal outcomes showed us what, what the impact of of, um, of chronic illness is. So, you know, in 2019, which is the last year where we had that data, we got data from a lot of sources, as you can see. And what we have in 2019 um, is if you look at the years of life lost, cardiovascular disease, neoplasms, as you can expect, they've been at the, they, they've been the top killers for a long time and they remain there. If you look at infectious diseases, they've been improving. It's quite interesting. You know, that's really been going down as you could expect. But then the, the um, uh, some chronic illnesses have been increasing. So you can expect that as well because people are living longer, but there is more death still that can be um, expected from chronic illness as people are living longer. Now, in terms of disability, there, there are some changes again. Mental, by the way, I wanted to show that mental disorders comes in a little lower down for years of life, of death, right? Of, of uh, years of life lost to death. So disability though is much higher uh, because it's a, a very important chronic illness. And I would say depression is the highest ranked of those. So when you look at both together, um, mental disorders has increased in a way in its dailies, overall dailies, and it's quite, quite high up there. And many of the infectious diseases have gotten, uh, have had a little bit of a lesser impact on the disability adjusted life years. I just, I, I'm sure it looks a little technical. I just thought that it would be interesting to show that uh, so that you get an idea of the global picture. Um, it's a little technical, but you know, it's, I think it's useful to know that we probably wouldn't know about what's going on with mental health disorders if we didn't have this uh, global burden of disease study. Um, so, what can we do about this? Uh, the um, mental health disorders that we're dealing with and the disability that comes of it. There's um, these are some re references. I'm not sure why I put them there, sort of put them at the end. But I want to look at whether these are treatable. So someone mentioned at the very beginning, okay, mental uh, health issues should be treatable. And many, many of them are treatable. And yes, they are. I think that it should be understood that we're dealing with something that, that is treatable. So if you were to draw lines here between uh, what you see as true in the first box and what you see is true in the second box, I'd be curious to know how you look at it. So are treatments, do treatments cure mental health disorders or mental disorders? Do treatments exist? Are there any, there are no effective treatments? Our treatments are mainly uh, adapting to the mental health disorders. So you can choose one of those or think of one of those. And then you can look at, even if you think whether cures exist or treatments exist, what do you think here in this first box? 
Uh, do we mainly have adaptations to illness? Uh, do we have effective treatments? You know, sometimes people feel that seeing that many people with mental health disorders are walking in, you know, in, our, in the streets of our cities, uh, maybe we're just doing better at adapting to mental illness. Any ideas there? Well, I think that cures do not exist for some forms of mental illness. Uh, some are situational depression, say. Um, that is a thing, but, but some people are born with a depressive gene, and I'm not sure that, that there's an overall cure that lasts forever. I think they have to stay on medication. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so cure, I think, is rare. Um, it does happen for people who have these short-term issues, but it's, there are, and, and I think that you're also highlighting that there are some effective treatments. Um, there are some, you know, they're effective, but they're not a cure. So there is an adaptation, like in many medical illnesses, but treatments exist. And the problem may be that there are impediments to accessing the treatments, as we mentioned before. So this is um, poor access of treatments that exist. So this is a sad situation that we should be able to do something about. What can we do about them? So, you know, this is what we call the treatment gap. So the percent of people who require care don't receive it. And we mentioned that at the very beginning in our quiz, we said about 50% of people who need help may not get it. So we can look at what are the factors that are playing into that. What would you do to reduce the treatment gap? What do you think are effective ways? You know, you have experience, for example, with people in your families or people that you've heard about with mental illness. What are, and I asked this to the medical students as well. What, what are you gonna do when you'll be docs? Or maybe you'll be administrators in, uh, in health to try to reduce that treatment gap. What do you think? I, I think we need more training uh, of resources. There isn't any, there, we're calling upon um, psychologists and psychiatrists now, and there's not enough of us, not, not enough counselors to, to uh, have a talk therapy, if you want. Okay, thank you. Any other inputs? I think you need to, uh, um, I, I think you need to convince people that it's okay. It's okay that you have this, this condition. Um, we have to avoid the, the, the stigma um, of that what you have is something that you should be ashamed of or you shouldn't really talk about it. And if you can convince people of that, then you're going to be able to, if you convince people that they should not be ashamed or humiliated because of what they have, uh, you're going to be in a better position to reduce the treatment gap. Yeah, good point. And, and, and stigma isn't only in the person who has the illness where they may feel like because of, but it's also in the attitudes of others, and uh, you may know this, but you know it's it's considered that the highest level of stigma against mental illness is in the is in the healthcare system. If you <laughs> if you work in an emergency room, you see that not uncommonly that um, people are shifted very very quickly to the psychiatric side, and you know someone who comes in, for example, with a mental illness, they they may have other problems as well, including health problems in, in, in addition to their, their mental illness, and they may be shifted either away from um, getting medical care, or they may be shifted also away from the emergency room altogether and back out. You know, we were talking before about the cold weather. The number of times where I've seen people coming in who don't have something which is dangerous or threatening, they just, you know, tell people, well, look, you know, call the, uh, the hospital and try to get yourself an appointment in the hospital. These are people who are disorganized. They don't have a cell phone. Um, they have no resources like family around and they're being, they're being sent out again. So, you know, I've seen people come in with frostbite and uh, because they were sent out on, 
on several occasions when people also with some chronic illnesses may not, you know, there, there is sometimes a cognitive um, chain deterioration in some people with mental illness. And it may be difficult for them to get organized to seek help. So Sh Sherry Ellen has uh, put up her hand off her and she's been patient. Ah, all okay, time. Sherry, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. No problem. I'm only seeing a little line here. Um, people, so. well, I can the see first, them all. So. Yeah, so you can tell us. Thank you, yes. Rick. The first thing I do want to say is how would you reduce the treatment gap? Well, funding. Ah. Funding. I mean, <laughs> It's been a very big ongoing problem in the yeah. mental health world. And I think um, since COVID, we all know uh, the increase in uh, mental illness that has uh, surfaced humongously so, you know, especially in young children. And um, Going back, though, to something before, the slide before, that um, do we have adaptations of uh, dealing with uh, treatment? Well, of course we do, because the evolution of, of learning about all these mental illnesses has changed so drastically over the years. Um, I can um, speak for myself that was I was not properly diagnosed. I was diagnosed as depressive um, from the time I was a teenager till I was 46 years old. And at 46 years old, I crashed. And my diagnosis was changed to bipolar type two. Okay, right. which, I've been well since with the right medications, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. However, when I was 15 years old, psychiatry didn't know about bipolar type 2. They knew about bipolar, manic depressive, and they knew about depression. So <laughs> there's a huge uh, gap um, in the learnings about yeah. the brain, et cetera. Yeah, wow, thanks so much for sharing that. that is Thank really, you, Sherry. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, uh, the other thing that was never considered is that could bipolar exist in kids, in, in teens? That was a no-no. It was like taboo to even think that. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be considered. You're right. Sorry, someone uh, else was talking. Jeff has ra raised his uh, yellow yeah. hand. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't look yellow to me. Um, okay. Um, I am struck, Dr. Laporta, by uh, an earlier slide that that um, showed that the WHO um, um, saw the problem as early back as early as 1948, um, and that infectious diseases was really where the world was what was focused on it it in my professional life uh for many years i i i worked for a very uh one one of the world's largest uh corporations and um during my tenure there um it was it was okay if you had cardiovascular disease if you suffered a heart attack or you had cancer and you're going to get all the sympathy in the world right and the company is going to get behind you here you're going to uh they, they dealt with a, a very good insurance company it was great insurance plan etc you you know you're going to get all, all all the help that's required and don't worry about your job because your job is always going to be waiting for you but it was very different for at least in the early years for someone that was diagnosed with a mental illness uh, because at that point in time, the attitude, and I'm talking about the attitude in general, and not just the company, but the people themselves, um, well, you can't have a mental illness, okay? You got to tough it up, mm -hmm. or in the vernacular, suck it up, uh, be a man uh, uh, type, type of thing. 
and um, for many people that 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 have it, um, rather than being effectively treated or you know start treatment, they would end up um, either uh, quitting their job or being put in a position where um, you're going to leave the company. And uh, so I think the biggest problem for, for mental health is the stigma that society attaches to it. And I think it's gotten better over the years, but I think it's still uh, a, a, a problem. Yeah, thanks for that. It's true. Yeah, thank you very much. The, yeah, the, the workplaces were, have not been well adapted to, um, to dealing with mental health disorders. And I think it speak, you're right, it speaks to stigma. I think it also speaks to the fact that uh, mental illness is not that easy to detect. And um, it's not rare that when someone is developing a mental illness, like depression is typical, it's uh, something which is gradual. And the moment where it becomes something which is an illness is really not easy for people to understand. So, you know, it looks like, you know, you're going through a hard time and we all do sometimes and it's a ubiquitous human experience. Um, having bad days or having days where you're more anxious, it's ubiquitous. And so, you know, recognizing it, it would be very nice if we had markers like you do for diabetes, um, where you can just look at the level of sugar, but we, we don't have those markers in, in psychiatry. So that's definitely contributed to making it difficult uh, to, um, to understand it as something which is biological as well, and that's real. And so it, I think that that's contributed to that sense that, well, you know, you're just experiencing something that I've experienced too. So, you know, kick yourself in the ass and uh, shape up, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's not easy. So, so I think, again, it's about being able to bring in some form of expertise that is able to tell the difference and say, look, there's something going on here. Um, take it at face value and it, you, you need treatment. You know, there's a diagnosis, there's treatment. And uh, maybe we're doing that. Do you think, Jeff, that we're doing that better now? I mean, do you have, did, did, did it change over time in this corporation? I, I, I mean, I've, um, I, I've left that corporation. I retired from that corporation many years ago. I think yeah. it is better, uh, but I can't tell you 100% for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I do some work for a company that now is, you know, I mean, initially what people were doing is people were taking sick leave for a long time. And after three months, six months, they're seen by an expert to figure out whether they're manipulating the system or if they're saying the truth. Really, really very, uh, very uneasy experience for, for patients. It was un unbelievably uh, unpleasant and um, uh, difficult for, for people to go through and uh, it didn't lead to positive outcomes. I think that now there's a tendency to intervene much earlier, work with the GPs. Uh, there's a chance to hopefully to educate GPs. So one of the solutions as well is going to not only specialists, but someone was mentioning the, the therapist that you can talk to, like psychologists, but also primary care because um, way before you get sick enough to see a specialist, you're going to have something more subtle that may lead you to see a primary care physician. And, and so primary care physicians, you know, training. So the first thing that was mentioned to reduce the gap was training. Training of primary care physicians uh, becomes very important in that and recognition and basic treatments for, um, for illness, which is maybe not as severe as one that would need to, to be treated in specialty care. So, you know, you, you've, you've outlined, I don't know if there are any other hands up, but so far you've outlined pretty much most of the slides that I was gonna- uh, I think that we have, uh, on, we are near the end of okay. our uh, conversation. And okay. I, I think that uh, if you have, Sherry, a quick question with quick answer, go ahead. I just want to say that in terms of the stigma, I think Bell Talk has done marvels um in trying 
to get that stigma reduced. But also, I have a real problem with the DSM-5, okay, because we know that it's the diagnostic manual for mental illness, mental health. And it seems that if you do this with your pinky all day long, you have a disorder, okay? Things have become so labeled that I find a lot in the mental health world has gotten out of hand it's it, yeah, it, yeah. it it's gone way beyond basics so maybe I, this is the moment yeah. to introduce one big problem with uh, what we call mental diseases that uh, we are hanging between two explanations of what it is one is functional the other is organic and this has been plugging uh, uh, psychiatry since the days uh, it was recognized and today it is very interesting to read what has been written by Dr. Insel, who was uh, for 10 years uh, head of uh, National Institute of Mental Health, uh, who said, we are in dark. We, we really do not understand anything. And then, of course, um, if you don't understand, how do you treat something that you know only by uh, appearance but you don't know what's behind. That's our big problem. And that's, okay, well, uh, that's, that, that, that's a, a big conversation that I'd, I'd love to have, but I right. just want to reassure you, <laughs> that's right. number one, that DSM is not the um, diagnostic manual which is used globally. That's right. WHO has uh, ICD, that's and the ICD has a chapter on uh, mental and behavioral disorders, which differs quite a bit from um, from uh, the IC, from the uh, DSM, the DSM now has become a manual that justifies for the practitioner why they're seeing someone and how they can they, they, they can build. So whatever you're seeing, you can you can give a name to it and you can build for it. I think it's much more of an administrative tool, unfortunately. Uh, but um, having said that, it remains true that Tom Insel was hoping that we would be able to um, have clear correspondences between behaviors and neurotransmitters, uh, specific neurotransmitters in the brain. And we've, things are much more complex than that. Just as we thought that, you know, uh, being able to um, get, a, get a DNA reading would resolve all of our problems for, for, for most medical illnesses, but it's much more complex than that, right? We're talking about protein and we're talking about, you know, turning them on and turning them off. And uh, um, the human body is, uh, you know, much, much more complex than, um, than a single variable. But, you know, rest assured, though, that the ICD, so International Classification of Diseases, looks more at um, clinically relevant uh, diagnostic categories. And I think you'll be reassured that it's not about, you're right though, that the DSM-5 is well, really contentious.